mammograms, discounted medicines if you're on Medicare. That's what the Affordable Care Act means. You're already getting a better deal. No lifetime limits. If you don't have health insurance, then starting on October 1st, private plans will actually compete for your business. And you'll be able to comparison shop online. There'll be a marketplace online, just like you'd buy a flat screen TV or plane tickets or anything else you're doing online. And you'll be able to buy an insurance package that fits your budget and is right for you. And if you're one of the up to half of all Americans who've been sick or have a pre-existing condition, if you look at this auditorium, about half of you probably have a pre-existing condition that insurance companies could use to not give you insurance if you lost your job or lost your insurance. Well, this law means that beginning January 1st, insurance companies will finally have to cover you and charge you the same rates as everybody else, even if you have a pre-existing condition. That's what the Affordable Care Act does. That's what it does. Now, look, I, I know, because uh, I've been living it, uh, that there are folks out there who are actively working to make this law fail. I mean, and I don't always understand exactly what their logic is here, why they think giving insurance to folks who don't have it and making folks with insurance a little more secure, why they think that's a bad thing. But despite the politically motivated misinformation campaign, the states that have committed themselves to making this law work are finding that competition and choice are actually pushing costs down. So just last week, New York announced that premiums for consumers who buy their insurance in these online marketplaces will be at least 50% lower than what they're paying today. 50% lower. So folks' premiums in the individual market will drop by 50%. And for them and for the millions of Americans who've been able to cover their sick kids for the first time, like this gentleman who, who just said his daughter's got health insurance, or been able to cover their employees more cheaply, or are able to have their kids who are younger than, who are, who are 25 or 26, stay on their parents' plan. For all those folks, For all those folks, you'll have the security of knowing that everything you've worked hard for is no longer one illness away from being wiped out. Now finally, as we work to strengthen these cornerstones of middle-class security, good job with decent wages and benefits, a good education, home of your own, retirement security, health care security. I'm going to make the case for why we've got to rebuild ladders of opportunity for all those Americans who haven't quite made it yet, who are working hard but are still suffering poverty wages, who are struggling to get full-time work. There are a lot of folks who are still struggling out here. Too many people in poverty. Now, here in America, we've never guaranteed success. That's not what we do. More than some other countries, we expect people to be self-reliant. Nobody's going to do something for you. We've tolerated a little more inequality for the sake of a more dynamic, more adaptable economy. That's all for the good. But that idea has always been combined with a commitment to equality of opportunity, to upward mobility. The idea that no matter how poor you started, if you're willing to work hard and discipline yourself and defer gratification, you can make it too. That's the American idea.
Unfortunately, opportunities for upward mobility in America have gotten harder to find over the past 30 years. And that's a betrayal of the American idea. And that's why we have to do a lot more to give every American the chance to work their way into the middle class. And the best defense against all of these forces, global competition, economic polarization, is the strength of the community. So we need, to, we need a new push to rebuild rundown neighborhoods. We need new partnerships. We need new partnerships with some of the hardest hit towns in America to get them back on their feet. And because no one who works full time in America should have to live in poverty, I am going to keep making the case that we need to raise the minimum wage because it's lower right now than it was when Ronald Reagan took office. It's time for the minimum wage to go up. We're not a people who allow chance of birth to decide life's biggest winners or losers. And after years in which we've seen how easy it can be for any of us to fall on hard times, folks in Galesburg, folks in the Quad Cities, you know they're good people who work hard. Sometimes they get a bad break. Plant leaves. Somebody gets sick. Somebody loses a home. We've seen it in our family, in our friends, in our neighbors. We've seen it happen, and that means we cannot turn our backs when bad breaks hit any of our fellow citizens. So good jobs, a better bargain for the middle class and the folks who are working to get into the middle class, an economy that grows from the middle out, not the top down. That's where I will focus my energies. That's where I'll focus my energies, not just for the next few months, but for the remainder of my presidency. These are the plans that I'll lay out across this country. But I won't be able to do it alone. So I'm going to be calling on all of us to take up this cause. We'll need our businesses, who are some of the best in the world, to pressure Congress to invest in our future. And I'll be asking our businesses to set an example by providing decent wages and salaries to their own employees. And I'm going to highlight the ones that do just that. You know, there are companies like, like Costco, which pays good wages and offers good benefits. <laughs> companies like, you know, there are companies like the Container Store that, that prides itself on training its employees and, and on employee satisfaction. Because these companies prove that it's not just good for the employees, it's good for their businesses to treat workers well. It's good for America. So I'm going, to be, I'm going to be calling on the private sector to step up. I will be saying to Democrats, we've got to question some of our old assumptions. We've got to be willing to redesign or get rid of programs that, that don't work as well as they should. We've got to be willing to We've got to embrace changes to cherish priorities so that they work better in this new age. We can't just, Democrats can't just stand pat and just defend whatever government's doing. If we believe that government can give the middle class a fair shot in this new century, and I believe that, we've got an obligation to prove it. And that means that we've got to be open to new ways of doing things. And we'll need Republicans in Congress to set aside short-term politics and work with me to find common ground. Now, you know, it's interesting, in the run-up to this speech, a lot of reporters say, that, well, you know, Mr. President, these are all good ideas, but some of them you've said before, some of them sound great, but you can't get those through Congress. 
Republicans won't agree with you. And I say, look, the fact is, there are Republicans in Congress right now who privately agree with me on a lot of the ideas I'll be proposing. I know because they've said so. But they worry they'll face swift political retaliation for cooperating with me. Now, there are others who will dismiss every idea I put forward, either because they're playing to their most strident supporters, or in some cases because, sincerely, they have a fundamentally different vision for America, one that says inequality is both inevitable and just, one that says an unfettered free market without any restraints inevitably produces the best outcomes, regardless of the pain and uncertainty imposed on ordinary families, and government's the problem, and we should just shrink it as, as small as we can. In either case, I say to these members of Congress, I'm laying out my ideas to give the middle class a better shot. So now it's time for you to lay out your ideas. You can't just be against something. You got to be for something. Even if you think I've done everything wrong, the trends I just talked about were happening well before I took office. So it's not enough for you to just to oppose me. You got to be for something. What are your ideas? If you're willing to work with me to strengthen American manufacturing and rebuild this country's infrastructure, let's go. If you've got better ideas, to bring down the cost of college for working families. Let's hear them. If, if you think you have a better plan for making sure that every American has the security of quality, affordable health care, then stop taking meaningless repeal votes and share your concrete ideas with the country. Repealing Obamacare and cutting spending is not an economic plan. It's not. If you're serious about a balanced, long-term fiscal plan that replaces the mindless cuts currently in place, or if you're interested in tax reform that closes corporate loopholes and gives working families a better deal, I'm ready to work. But you should know that I will not accept deals that don't meet the basic test of strengthening the prospects of hardworking families. This is the agenda we have to be working on. We've come a long way since I first took office. You know, as a country, as a country, we're older and wiser. I don't know if I'm wiser, but I'm certainly older. <laughs> and you know, as long as Congress doesn't manufacture another crisis, as long as we don't shut down the government, just because I'm for keeping it open, uh, as long as we as, lo as long as we don't risk a U.S. default over paying bills that we've already racked up, something that we've never done, we can probably muddle along without taking bold action. If we stand pat and we don't do any of the things I talked about, our economy will grow, although slower than it should. New businesses will form. The unemployment rate will probably tick down a little bit. Just by 
virtue of our size and our natural resources.